Hello and welcome to the Clinical Cases series. Today we're going to be looking at the cases that we learned about in the first week of the urogenital block in second year. So to start with we were taught about urinary tract stones and the staghorn calculus. So urinary tract stones are stones um, that are hard masses which form in either the urinary tract or the bladder. Small stones will present with no pain whatsoever for the patient and no symptoms. However, larger stones can cause excruciating pain. Usually it's men that are affected and usually the ones that are older than 50 due to prostate enlargement. So that's one of the leading causes of urinary tract stones in men. Um, however, there are other causes to be aware of as well. In terms of the stones, they're likely to get stuck at three places in the ureters. So the three ureteric constrictions. So being aware of the anatomy of ureters is really important in helping to paint a picture in your head of where these stones are forming. Um, it's also important to be aware that usually they can cause a urinary tract infection following them being becoming stuck because urine gets um, lodged behind the stone because it can't pass, which then causes to bacteria building up and therefore a urinary tract infection. Another thing to be aware of is the staghorn calculus. So this is something we've placed quite a bit of an emphasis on in the lecture. It forms in the shape of the renal pelvis, which is the brown part of this diagram here. Um, and it's usually caused by a recurrent infection, and usually the patient will present with fever, hematuria, which is ureter, blood in the urine, and flank pain. Moving on, we were taught about ischioanal abscesses. So an ischioanal abscess originates from an infection which arises in the epithelium, which lines the anal canal. And it's good to be aware that the anal mucosa is actually a very vulnerable place to injury, and can be torn as well by hard feces. The causes of an ischioanal abscess... Um, so abscesses are caused by high density infection of common bacteria which collect in one place or another and then without treatment they can spread to other parts of the body, particularly the groin and rectal area. It's also good to be aware that occasionally the um, abscesses will spread, so if they penetrate one layer of the epithelium they may spread to another region, so you've got an ischioanal abscess here, you've got a perineal abscess here, and you've got a supralevator abscess here. So it's good to be aware of the different types of abscess um, and where they are on a diagram. And this diagram here will allow you to practice that. Usually, however, this is misdiagnosed in clinical practice as hemorrhoids because it comes on in terms of pain with sudden anal discomfort and pain in the perineal area. So usually, uh, jumping the gun will lead people to diagnose as hemorrhoids, but it is important to investigate it properly and treat it effectively. CKD is what we were next taught about. So this is a progressive loss of kidney function over a period of months and years. Um, so what's really important there is it's a progressive um, loss of kidney function. The easiest way to think about this disease is to think about normal kidney function and then how that can go wrong. So if you know that your normal kidney functions are to excrete products, uh, it's got a role in homeostasis, it's got a role in endocrine secretion and endocrine metabolism. If you know the normal kidney functions, then CKD is really quite an easy disease to get your head around because it's basically those go wrong over a long period of time. In the early stages, normally there are no symptoms and it's only picked up in tests. Uh, but in more advanced stages, you will notice that the patients present with tiredness, swollen ankles, so edema, shortness of breath, feeling sick and blood in the urine. There are several causes of chronic kidney disease and these can range from diabetes, it could be a vascular cause such as hypertension, renovascular or age um, and there are a few others here at the bottom but these are slightly less common. Uh, in terms of treatment it depends on the stage so how we monitor CKD it is divided into five stages. So the first stage is where your GFR is greater than 90 so this indicates kidney damage but you've got a normal or increased GFR. Stage 2, where you expect your GFR to be between 60 and 89. So there's a slight decrease in GFR, um, but with other evidence of kidney damage. Th uh, stage 3 can be split into 3A and 3B. So that can be 45 to 59 for 3A and 30 to 44 for GFR for 3B. So this is a moderate decrease in GFR with or without evidence of kidney damage. Stage 4, your GFR you'd expect it to be between 15 and 29. So this is a severe, severe decrease in GFR with or without other evidence of kidney damage 
and stage five so this is where your gfr is below 15 which is critically low and really where we'd be establishing renal failure alongside the treatment which could be medication dialysis or kidney transplant depending on the stage of uh, ckd we do advise all patients to stop smoking and watch their salt intake and also to lose weight if they are obese aki is acute kidney injury so this can be split up into three causes which i've done at the bottom here these are really the basic um, outline causes of AKI, but you need to know them in a lot more detail um, from the lecture. So acute kidney injury is an abrupt loss um, of kidney function that develops over a period of roughly seven days. It can range from mild function disturbance to complete loss of function. Essentially, how can we detect it? Well, in clinical practice, we can see a rapid drop in GFR. We can see rising creatinine and rising urea. Uh, the patient will also retain nitro nitrogenous waste and there'll be disturbances um, in extracellular fluid volume and electrolytes and acid base balance. So what's really important there is again you can link it to normal kidney function. So when that kidney function goes wrong you should be investigating for AKI. So normal creatinine falls in the range between 50 and 130 um, umol per litre. The problem with this is it's a big range, so it can vary massively from person to person, and this base this is based on factors such as muscle mass, which obviously, as you can imagine, deteriorates with age. So you'd expect an 87-year-old lady's um, creatinine to be much lower than a 25-year-old lady's creatinine uh, because there'll be differences in muscle mass. In terms of symptoms, again, it's likely that in the early stages there won't actually be any symptoms at all, um, but in the later stages they may experience nausea, vomiting, dehydration and confusion. In terms of risk factors for acute kidney injury, you'd be expecting the patients to be over 65 um, and already have a kidney problem maybe, so for example CKD, uh, it might be a long-term disease, dehydration, blockage of the urinary tract uh, or severe infections. There's quite a lot of causes, um, so we'd probably determine them as risk factors. Uh, in terms of causes, so you can have pre-renal causes, renal causes and post-renal causes. So thinking about that logically, we've got stages 1, 2 and 3, which if you relate them to the diagram up here, you've got stage 1, pre-renal, before the kidney, 2, renal, within the kidney or intra-renal, and 3, post-renal, after the kidney. Okay, and the numbers are clearly on the diagram there, which so you can link them up properly. In terms of pre-renal um, causes, so you could have hypovolemia, cardiogenic shock, hepatorenal problems, or medications. Um, essentially, as a broad topic, you can relate pre-renal causes to cardiovascular problems. Um, and essentially, your kidney must compensate, um, but the kidney compensating, it becomes overwhelmed and consequently leads to the GFR falling. In terms of renal causes, you can generally sum these up as glomerulus or tubule problems. So, for example, tubular necrosis, myeloma, glomerular nephritis, vasculitis and renal artery and vein obstructions and again medications crops up. So medications it's really important to be aware of um, NSAIDs um, and ACE inhibitors because they have a real impact on a patient developing AKI. Post renal causes you can relate this to the ureter of a bladder due to its location um, so it could be a tumour so it could be a pelvic bladder tumour, prostate problem, um, it could be a bladder outflow obstruction for example urinary tract stones um, or it could be retroperitoneal fibrosis. Moving on, we looked at two types of cancer. So we looked at bladder cancer and kidney cancer. So bladder cancer is any of several types of cancer uh, which arises within the bladder. Um, however, the most common is the transitional cell carcinoma. So this is quite understandable really because the epithelial lining of the bladder is transitional cell. So therefore, transitional cell carcinoma makes up the majority of bladder cancers. But you can also have squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma as well. In terms of treatment for this, um, surgery is probably the most likely route. However, they will try chemotherapy first. Usually, it becomes um, noticeable in patients between 65 and 85 years old. And symptoms are hematuria uh, and pain when urinating and more frequent urination. The problem with the presentation of bladder cancer is that it presents with hematuria, um, but so does kidney cancer, so does sometimes um, urinary tract stones. So it's differentiating the difference. Okay, So if you're seeing blood in urine, maybe think cancer first. When it's eliminated, then you can think of the less um, life-threatening causes. 
In terms of risk factors, smoking is probably a big one on here, um, and also chemicals. So this can be an occupational risk. Um, so, for example, dyes of the rubber industry, they can also lead um, to bladder cancer. In terms of staging of this, there's not too much. Inf there's not really any information on here about staging, uh, but from the lecture you'll know that bladder cancer is staged broadly um, as from grade one, two, or three. Uh, with grade one being less severe and grade three being more severe. However, in a more detailed staging um, approach, you can look at TNM, so tumor nodule metastases, um, where a T1 is better than T4. So T1 is a superficial cancer of the bladder. T2 is where it's gone through the muscle of the bladder. T3, where the tumor's grown into the fatty layer. And T4, where the tumor has invaded other tissues. Having said that, bladder cancer is quite unique and it has two additional stages. So it's got the TA stage, which is where the cancer is very superficial, and the TIS stage, where the cancer is becoming deeper. Um, so being aware of the staging is quite important uh, clinically, but I'm not quite sure how important that is for exams. Kidney cancer is another type of cancer that we were taught about, and it's one of the most common types of cancer in the UK. Uh, and the two most common types of kidney cancer are renal cell carcinoma and transitional cell carcinoma. Again, risk factors are quite similar to those with bladder cancer, so smoking, obesity, family history, regular use of NSAIDs. Uh, it's got a few that are unique though, so infection with hepatitis C can increase your risk of kidney cancer and previous cancer treatment as well. Um, usually it's diagnosed through a urine sample, an ultrasound scan or a biopsy. So the most common way to do this is through a cystoscopy, um, where you put a small camera into the bladder and can take a biopsy. Um, from where you think the kidney cancer is. In terms of pathophysiology, there's some information here that you can read through. So this is just about the different types of kidney cancer that we need to be aware of. And the grading system is actually clarified much clearer here, so TNM, uh, what we were just discussing in the previous slide. Here are a few ultrasound images um, of bladder and kidney cancer. Um, so you've got ultrasound here and CT scans at the bottom. Um, so you Essentially, it's really important to know the normal anatomy on an ultrasound and a CT because then you can distinguish that, for example, this is abnormal, this is bladder cancer here. You can distinguish that this is a renal tumour in comparison to what a normal kidney would look like. Again, you can understand that here this is a tumour if you know what the bladder normally looks like on a CT. Um, the white stuff, that's just contrast that's been put in uh, and the urine sits on top of the contrast. Lastly, in this video, we're going to look at glomerulonephritis. So it's a term used to refer to several kidney diseases, but essentially you should be thinking about inflammation with this disease. You can split it up uh, in a few ways. You can split it up into acute and chronic, or non-proliferative and proliferative. So acute glomerul glomerulonephritis um, forms suddenly, uh, and it usually occurs after an infection. The chronic form, however, may develop silently. So when we say silently, we mean without symptoms over several years, uh, and that often leads to complete kidney failure in the end. To split it up um, more intensely, really, you've got non-proliferative and proliferative forms. So I've listed the three main important ones here. Uh, this wasn't massively covered in week one lectures. However, um, it is an important disease that relates to quite a lot of the ones we were taught about. So having an understanding of it is quite important. Knowing all the finer details might not be as important. Um, but in terms of treatment for this, uh, usually we advise that the patient reduce their intake of salt, potassium and fluid. Again, smoking will make the disease worse, so advising smoking cessation is really important. Immunosuppressant medication and corticosteroid steroid medication as well is really important in um, treating glomerulonephritis. That's all for this video. Uh, next time we will be looking at the diseases that we learn about in week two of your genital. Um, I hope you enjoyed this one or found it useful to some extent. And as always, if you've got any feedback, please leave them in the comments below or message me personally. They're greatly appreciated. Thank you.